I am here to introduce Kathleen Lowenstein, who is a doctoral student at Michigan State University. Uh, her research focuses on the ethics of mental health and illness with a specific focus on lived experience of voice hearing and experiences commonly understood as psychosis. So Kathleen is gonna talk for a little while and then I think she's gonna take uh, some questions. You can raise your hand, you can put questions. I think we have Q in, uh, in the chat and we will try to uh, get to them. Thanks very much. All right, um, so can everyone see the screen? Someone say yes, because I can't see everybody. Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful. Um, yeah, so as Jessica said, my name is Kathleen Lonstein, and I'm a doctoral student in philosophy at Michigan State University. And my research focuses on integrating perspectives from critical mental health spaces into our understanding of ethical responses to madness and distress, particularly in response to experiences that are commonly understood as severe mental illness, such as experiences commonly understood as psychosis. And my presentation today is going to be focusing on the emerging discipline of MAD studies and how that can inform how we think about bioethics more generally. Um, so presentation is titled Engaging the Margins, Exploring the Intersections of Critical Mental Health and Bioethics. And to give a brief overview of the presentation, I'm not gonna be taking the full 45 minutes because I really value us being able to like, have a conversation and talk through material and ideas. So this presentation is probably gonna be about 20 minutes long and then we'll have some space at the end for Q&A and I'm really looking forward to hearing people's questions and feedback. And then if we end a little bit early, that's okay. And I also wanted to just say that I really appreciate everyone coming here on a Saturday, particularly, because I know that there's just something about Zoom conferences that are does different from traditional conferences. Um, but to give a brief overview of the presentation, I'm going to be first covering how we think about madness and bioethics, giving a brief overview of that, and then talking about what does it mean to be mad in the emerging discipline of mad studies, and then talk, going from there to the main point of the presentation, which is talking about the intersections of critical mental health and bioethics. And in specific, I'm going to be covering some of the conceptual problems or gaps in how bioethics currently approaches madness, discussing some interventions from mad studies specifically, and then talking about, as I noted, the intersection of mad studies and bioethics. So how do we typically think about madness in bioethics? Well, if we think about how madness is traditionally framed and when we think about ethical responses to madness and distress within bioethics specifically, which is my home discipline, I'm training to become a bioethicist. Um, there's a focus on the individual and individual relation to pathology. There's often discussions of autonomy, capacity determinations, things such as informed consent to treatment or informed consent for research. And often there's an inherent assumption of pathological processes, such as an implicit assumption of impaired capacity, even though we know that empirically capacity doesn't map to specific diagnostic categories in any sort of substantive way. And frequently the way in which madness is framed is in done so in an inherently pathologizing way. E.g. questions are asked such as whether an individual can even participate in decisions regarding care. Additionally, mental health issues have been a topic of relatively little focus in bioethics, though they're starting to receive increasing uptake through the work of people like Lura Gertrude Grimes and Mohammed Rashid, which I'll touch upon later in the presentation. Now, this is interesting because the origin story of bioethics actually includes the history of advocating for historically marginalized groups. The birth of bioethics happened in response to many egregious human rights violations involving individuals who are considered historically vulnerable, such as those from minority groups, individuals who identify as disabled, or individuals in institutions. And this includes in individuals with diagnoses of mental illness. They're recognized as a vulnerable population. And so the lack of focus in bioethics more generally is interesting. But additionally, this recognition of vulnerability can have a paradoxical effect of further constituting individuals as vulnerable. As Brackenrush, Bell, and Racine note, the terms vulnerable and vulnerability can have an unintended effect of stymieing rather than stimulating discussion about ethical inclusion in research, often leading to the exclusion of participants identified as vulnerable from research. And similarly, we see that within bioethics, sometimes individuals are constituted as vulnerable due to a diagnosis impact on the individual without addressing other factors that might motivate responses to the individual, such as assumptions of deficit agency and capacity. 
Now, insights from critical mental health make the argument that inherent assumptions within categories themselves shape a response to an understanding of experiences of distress, particularly experiences understood as severe mental illness or experiences that would be considered to be psychosis. But the standard model of mental illness elides these structural factors and experience of madness or distress. If these are addressed at all, this is done via focus on factors such as stigma, which still place the focus primarily on the individual. And this doesn't allow space for the individual negotiation of the way in which responses to madness and distress shape both service user and clinician experience and understanding of illness. So overall, we see a lack of interrogation of the interplay between the stigmatized nature of diagnosis itself and assumptions of deficit agency and capacity, and a lack of focus on identity aspects of illness. And this is important because, as Tanya Lerman notes, one of the challenges of living with schizophrenia in the United States is the clear identity conferred by the diagnostic label itself. And she notes that the label schizophrenia is often toxic for those who acquire it. It creates what Erwin Goffman called a spoiled identity that places the individual in opposition to the non-labeled social world. Similarly, Angela Woods notes that the schizophrenia label is widely regarded as one of the most spoiled or stigmatized identities a person can be assigned. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Kathleen, can you yes. slow down a little bit? The ASL interpreters are having trouble keeping up with you. Yes. Thanks. All right. So similarly, the schizophrenia label is widely regarded as one of the most spoiled or stigmatized identities a person can be assigned through the process of psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, as Angela Woods notes. And just yell at me again if I keep speaking incredibly fast. Um, so this, what is MAD studies? Well, MAD studies is important because it allows for direct interrogation with the stigma previously mentioned. MAD studies is an emerging academic discipline that makes the argument that madness can be understood as an aspect of identity rather than pathology. And specifically, it challenges the idea of mental illness as inherently negative and argues that it can instead be understood as an aspect of identity. And a good example of this is things such as the Hearing Voices Network, which argues for voice hearing as a normal human experience. Similar to this, it's similar to arguments from queer theory or arguments for LGBTQ rights. Math studies ask how we came to think of certain forms of mental differences constituting illness, why we do so, and whose voices are centered in these discussions. And it rises out of a long history of mental patients' voices being silenced or ignored in clinical discourse. As Peter Beresford notes, mad studies can be seen as the first survivor-led movement, which has sought to develop a strong philosophical and theoretical base. Building on that, Peter Beresford notes that while there have been like there's been work within places such as disability studies and queer theory, until the emergence of mad studies, there was no similar development in the psychiatric survival movement. This is not to say that it did not identify key principles for collective action, like speaking and acting for themselves and being treated with equality and developing user-led schemes for support, highlighting the social relations to distress, because there's a long history of psychiatric survivor activism and advocacy that dates back in some places hundreds of years, but until the emergence of mad studies, there wasn't a movement that was seeking to develop a strong philosophical and theoretical base and unite many of the common sort of forms of activism and advocacy that we've seen happening across the world with things such as the psychiatric survivor movement and arguments for mad pride and things like the Hearing Voices Network. And math studies is important because it allows us to acknowledge the identity making aspect of forms of mental difference commonly understood as mental illness. And this is important because meaning making has been listed as a key feature in integrating experiences and or recovery, particularly from experiences commonly understood as severe forms of mental illness. And it opens up a space for explicit acknowledgement of experiences of alienation and marginalization related to being mad identified and or someone identified as mentally ill. And it centers the voices of those historically most marginalized in the discourse. And this is important let's, because- let's, let's slow down again, okay, sorry. Okay. No, you're fine. Okay. We're just, we, we definitely have enough time, so I could- We have time, take, take about, your but... time talking. Everybody is really, you're, you're covering a lot of great stuff. So we just wanna hear um, Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I just saw the messages because I was reading the slides and that. All right, so um, this meaning making focus is important because when we look at how treatment for psychosis is traditionally framed and the way in which individuals are typically responded to, assumptions of deficit agency and capacity are integral to most research and treatment in psychosis, even if they're not explicitly articulated. For example, individuals are rarely, if ever, asked what their experiences mean to them as their response is considered indicative of pathology. 
Individuals are frequently reassured that they have no control over disease processes when they express a felt sense of agency. And there's an assumption of individuals has vulnerable and lacking capacity that leads to a lack of engagement with their perspectives. As Jennifer Radden notes, within the master narrative, psychotic episodes are at most opportunity costs in a more functional life trajectory and no more meaningful than a bad dream. This includes but goes beyond the usual epistemic injustices inflicted on members of marginalized groups by the broader society. And moreover, it reflects sources of power that are augmented through institutionalized expertise and authority. So how do we integrate these sorts of pushbacks into our understanding of ethical responses to madness and distress? Well, when we think about this, this generally means centering perspectives of mad identified individuals and or consumer survivor ex patient perspectives. And this can involve integrating theoretical insights from mad studies and radical mental health spaces into our discussions of ethics of mental health and illness more broadly, which often involves things such as rethinking concepts like lack of insight and psychosis, how we're framing our understanding and debate around medical aid and dying, how we think about capacity and competency distinctions and a focus, as I mentioned, on centering the voices of those most historically marginalized in an explicit move towards decentering the sort of professional expertise that Rad notes that is often institutionalized and therefore doesn't really sort of like admit of any sort of pushback and leads to like a lack of epistemic standing on the part of those identified as mentally ill. And in particular, it involves taking a critical and self-reflexive approach to implicit assumptions within categories themselves. And the main intervention is thinking about the ways in which institutional structures themselves can help to form, create, or perpetuate categories of patienthood and assumptions of deficit agency and capacity. And so we see a shift, an epistemological shift to meaning in states rather than an implicit assumption of deficit. And a good example of like, a critical pushback against this that reflects an epistemological shift to meaning is the Hearing Voices Network, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, which makes the argument that voices and visions are real experiences and argues for finding meaning and value in experiences of voice hearing and shifts a focus from pathology and deficit capacity in relation to symptoms to one in which voices are integrated and understood within life context. And then the mouth studies move, right, of advocating for centering the experience of the individuals who would historically be regarded as mentally ill or the mad identified individuals, it reclaims power and agency by positioning voice hearers as experts by experience and shifts a focus from pathology and deficit capacity to one in which what is historically considered symptoms are integrated and understood within life context. And therefore it radically transforms the standard focus of mental illness by centering meaning making and identity in discussions of voice hearing. Similarly, a mass studies oriented approach to ethical responses to care acknowledges structural issues and lived experience of distress because as many researchers have noted, the system itself can be inherently crazy making. As Sue Estreff has noted, it often paces patients in an inescapable double bind. And similarly, symptoms read as madness may instead be adaptive responses to a crazy making system itself. Has Agnes Ringer notes in her ethnographic study of individuals experiencing standard treatment for psychosis, the identity work that individuals are required to do in order to function within those systems often places them within a crazy making double bind. As she notes, one interesting aspect of the analysis is the identity work that patients had to undertake to avoid being rendered problematic or inauthentic. They were required to assume a specific reflexive position in relationship to their difficulties um, that in order to re continue receiving care, but if they appear to need too much care, they risk being positioned as lacking insight, whereas on the other hand, if they acted with too much volition, they risk being considered not really ill and therefore be could be excluded from care. And so this balance was difficult to manage. And as she notes in her analysis, not all patients, all right, I'm slowing down again. <laughs> not all um, patients were able to um, sort of like manage that inherent double bind because like it's basically impossible to manage, right? There's no right answer there. Um, similarly, when we see this um, epistemological shift to meaning, it also involves a interrogation of how we think about and frame stigma. Because as Jim Van Alst notes, stigma is not something that solely exists at the locus of individuals experiencing mental health crises. It can also be something that people meet with on the part of providers, which he calls iatrogenic stigma, right? The way in which a provider's assumptions of deficit capacity and 
inherent biases regarding course of something such as schizophrenia can impact their response to an understanding of the individual. And similarly, stigma inherent to cultural expectations regarding mental illness itself, particularly severe mental illness, is something that isn't often engaged with, but in non studies opens up the space for engagement with. All right, so moving on to engaging with critical approaches and making an effort to speak much, much lower. Um, one of the argument, main arguments for my dissertation, um, and I can also go back if anyone needs me to go back and review some slides, um, is that critical mental health spaces such as the Hearing Voices Network or places like ISPS frame ethical approaches to madness and distress differently. And this is reflected in approach to care and framing of experiences of madness and distress. And one of the primary things I'm trying to do in my own work is interrogate how that difference cashes out in terms of response to individuals in distress and in terms of how ethics itself is thought of more generally. Because if we think about the standard framing of ethics and mental health, it thinks that ethics has explicitly in terms of things such as risk management, we think about when we talk about individuals as being potentially dangerous to themselves or others, in terms of informed consent, which often follows the form, but not the intent of informed consent. Like I'm sure we've all had the experience of being at the doctor's office and you're given this long form and you're supposed to sign the form to show informed consent for a specific thing. But in reality, what informed consent is supposed to be is someone sitting down and talking through the risks and benefits of treatment with you and making sure that you fully understand those to the best of your ability, that any questions you have have been answered. And oftentimes it's just sort of merged into this thing where it's like, here, sign this form to show that you've given consent. And bioethicists are really fond of going, that's, that's not actually consent because you don't know what you're consenting to, right? You haven't had space held for asking questions, for having discussions about risks. And then also when we look at the standard framing of ethics and mental health, a lot of it revolves around questions of capacity to consent to care or to deny care, which as I noted previously, really only engages with the individual in questions of you know, limited agency or limited capacity. And we also see implicit ethical assumptions in terms of how we frame these questions of risk, what situations are considered crisis and in terms of general goals of treatment. Now, my argument is that a mad stories oriented approach reframes ethics in a much more holistic way. And it builds on work in feminist and critical disability studies regarding ethics, so that ethics is in many ways understood in relationship to the other. And it centers our understanding of ethical responses to care as needing to be understood within specific contexts and also needing to take power dynamics more explicitly into account. And this also changes how we think about standard ethics questions in terms of crisis, in terms of risk, in terms of how we think about autonomy, all of which I'm happy to like speak about more in terms of going back to review previous slides or just talking through in terms of the Q&A also if needed. Um, so the argument in general is that our standard approach to ethical responses to madness and distress is lacking in many ways. And when we think about insights from critical mental health, they make the argument that inherent assumptions within the categories themselves can shape a response to an understanding of experiences of distress, particularly severe mental illness. But as I noted, our standard model of mental illness aligns these structural factors and experiences of madness or distress. If these are done at all, this is done to be on a focus of factors such as stigma, which still place the focus primarily on the individual. It doesn't allow space for individual negotiation of the way in which responses to madness and distress shape both service users and clinician understanding and experience of illness. And as I previously noted, there's a lack of the interrogation of the interplay between the stigmatized nature of diagnosis itself and assumptions of deficit capacity and agency. And math studies main intervention is that it allows us to acknowledge the identity making aspect of forms of mental difference, which as I previously noted is important because meaning making is listed as a key feature in integrating experiences and or recovery, particularly from experiences commonly understood as severe forms of mental illness. It opens up a space for explicit acknowledgement of experiences of alienation and marginalization related to being mad identified and or someone is mentally ill. And it centers the voices of those who are historically most marginalized in the discourse. Some key points, re key points regarding that are that things regarded as pathology may constitute an important aspect of identity. A person that assumptions within categories themselves can help to create situations of distress, reduce agency or deficit capacity. So our standard narrative of illness itself can foster expectations of reduced capacity. Um, the point about stigma needing to be something that's more holistically interrogated in that it can also be related to our cultural expectations regarding mental illness and mad studies opening up the space for engagement with that. And then more generally, 
more generally, um, integrating critical approaches involves taking a critical and self-reflexive approach to implicit assumptions within the categories themselves. And as I previously noted, the main intervention is thinking about the way in which institutional structures themselves can help to form, create, or perpetuate categories of patienthood and assumptions of deficit agency and capacity, and this epistemological shift to meaning in states rather than an implicit assumption of deficit.